Today we'll discuss the inference for average stream effects. The average stream effects, we're going to look at them as causal quantity of interest. There are two types of average stream effects. First is a sample average stream effect. So this is the average stream effect within a sample or SATE. The second one is the population average stream effect, which is the average stream effect for the population that's paid. We'll look at uh, the simple difference in means estimator, just comparing the means between the treatment and the control groups. And then we'll show that using design-based approach developed by George Neyman, the statistician, uh, which will focus on the use of randomization of the treatment assignment and the random sampling of units from a population to uh, make a statistical inference. So this is similar to permutation test where the actual randomization, the act of randomization is used to justify statistical inference. In particular, we'll show um, how to derive exact moments of the estimator under these approaches. And then we'll discuss asymptotic confidence intervals. Okay, let's start with example. Uh, this example is about social pressure and turnout. Uh, the research was published in 2008. The study was based on August 2006 primary election in Michigan. It involved a large number of households, 180,000 households. And several uh, the, these households received the postcards with several different messages. In particular, uh, they randomly assigned uh, each household to a group. Uh, treatment or control group. The one group received no message, so this serves as a control group. Another group received a message saying that turnout, voting, is a, a civic duty, so you should vote. The third group uh, received the message saying you're being studied, so this is in order to ascertain the possibility of Hoson effect. Hoson effect is the effect of being studied. So people may behave differently if they know they're being studied. The fourth message, uh, which is of interest, the main interest to this study, was the neighborhood social pressure message. So what is the neighborhood social pressure message? This is the actual postcard that was used in the study. Dear registered voter, what if your neighbors knew whether you voted? Why do so many people fail to vote? We've been talking about the problem for years, but it only seems to get worse. This year, we are taking a new approach. We are sending this mailing to you and your neighbors to publicize who does and does not vote. The chart shows the names of some of your neighbors, showing uh, which have voted in the past. After the August 8th, election, we intend to mail an updated chart. You and your neighbors will all know who voted and who did not. Do your civic duty vote. And then you see the list of the uh, names of the neighbors and whether they voted in the previous election. In the uh, United States, whether you voted or not uh, is a public information, although obviously because of the secret ballot, which candidate you voted for is not uh, public information. So this is actually uh, an information that people could um, actually figure, find out if they wanted to know. So here's the you're being studied message. So this is trying to get at this whole sound effect. Dear registered voter, you're being studied. Why do so many people fail to vote? We've been talking about this problem for years but it only seems to get worse. This year we're trying to figure out why people do or do not vote. We'll be studying voter turnout uh, in the August 8th primary election. Our analysis will be based on public records, so you will not be contacted again or distribute, disturbed in any way. Anything we learn about your voting or not voting will remain confidential and will not be disclosed to anyone else. Do your civic duty vote. So this is all about being studied and there's no list of neighbors uh, and their turnout records. So this is the data uh, that looks like. Uh, so um, here we see four different groups, uh, different turnout rate, and the number of voters in each group. 
So the control group is the largest group, and there's only 30% of people who live in that group. Civic duty was a little bit better, but it's only slightly better, only you know about um, two percentage point better than the control group. And the wholesome uh, group, wholesome in fact being studied, uh, that group was wasn't also that much that different from the civic duty. Interestingly, it's a little bit better than the control group, um, but the effect is small. What stands out in this ta ta table is the neighborhood social pressure group, which had the 37.0% turnout, which is you know by far the largest, highest in among these four groups. So we can look at um, what the effect of uh, receiving the neighborhood social pressure relative to the control group. And the easiest thing to do is to do difference in means. So we compute the mean, which in this case, turnout rate, because the outcome is whether you voted or not. So the mean is the rate uh, of turnout. And so the, in, in this uh, slide, you see tau hat is a difference in means estimator, where the first term is the mean of the achievement group. And this is a neighborhood social uh, pressure group. And then subtracting what you're subtracting is the control group. Again, the TI here is equal to one if you're in the neighborhood social pressure group, uh, zero if it's in a, in a control group as we used uh, notation that we used before. And the difference in this case is 7.8 percentage point. Uh, so that's a very big increase given that you only send out the little postcard. We can compute the standard errors. This is also um, usual standard error formula. Uh, you basically compute the variance of the achievement group. That's the variance of y given t equal one term divided by the sample size of the achievement group n one, and then you add the uh, the variance of the control group, uh, which divide divided also by n zero, which is the size of the control group. And then you add those two variances up and then take a square root. So this is a standard sort of uh, the variance, the standard error formula for the difference in means estimator in randomized experiment. And in this case, the um, standard error is about a 0.3 percentage point. Okay. So we can construct the 95% confidence intervals by um, using a critical value, so um, 1.96. And then multiply that by certain errors and then add and subtract uh, to the point estimate. Okay. So that will give us about uh, 7.2 to 8.4 percentage point. That's the 95% confidence interval. So this is all standard um, analysis that anyone would conduct if you have randomized experiment. A question here that, that I would like to discuss today is how can we justify this standard difference in means analysis from the randomization perspective? Where does this estimator and uh, standard errors come from? So it turns out that inference with the difference in means estimator is due to uh, Georgie Neyman, uh, his 1923 paper that was published in Polish and wasn't uh, translated to English until 1990. He basically look at the difference in means estimator, which I reproduce it here. It's the same thing as before. The first term is the mean of the uh, treatment group outcome, and the second term is the mean of the control group outcome. And he first showed that this um, um, estimator is unbiased for sample average treatment effect. So remember the definition of sample average streaming effect, which is written there, one over n, sum of y, y of one minus y of zero. So y of one minus y of zero is the unit level streaming effect, and mean of that, that is the definition of the sample average streaming effect. What he showed is that expectation of this difference in means estimator, so expectation of tau hat, I write it explicitly here, conditional on curry O n, which is the um, the correction of all potential outcomes. So that emphasizes the fact that, that we're going to focus we're going to focus on the sample, and the only thing that's random here is achievement. Okay, so expectation is taken over the distribution of t. T is the only thing that's random. 
y of 0 and y of 1 is conditioned upon and um, t decides which one we get to see, right? The treatment status decides if the t equal 1, we see y of 1. If t equals 0, uh, we see y of 0. So if we take expectation over this treatment assignment, then the mean of the difference in means estimator on average equals to sample average streaming effect. Okay, so what this means is that over repeated treatment assignments, over repeated random randomized treatment assignments. So if you are to conduct the experiment over and over, hypothetically, many, many times, and suppose each time you assign the treatment um, to different units, right, because it's random, and then compute this difference in means estimator. And then you repeat this uh, many times, so then each time you get diff slightly different estimate, okay? If you, and you do this many, over and over, and you take, uh, take the average of all these different, slightly different average streaming fact estimate, difference in means estimator, then this average of all these different estimate, estimates is gonna be exactly equal to the true sample average streaming effect. That's what we mean by unbiasedness. It's unbiasedness over uh, repeated treatment assignment, hypothetically repeated treatment assignment. So any given estimate you obtain, because in reality, you only get to do experiment once. So you have one estimate. Right? We don't know whether that estimate is close to the truth or not. But what we know is that if we do this experiment over and over, and each time we compute difference means estimate, and then collect all those estimates and take the average, that average is going to be exactly the same as the true value of sample average streaming effect. So that's what this, uh, that's what we mean by unbiasedness. Uh, so again, it's a design-based idea where the only randomness comes from the treatment assignment. To look at a bit more detail, we can take expectation. Expectation is a linear operator, so we can fold it into the summation. And since we condition on the potential outcome, y of 1, for example, is a constant, so it comes out of the uh, summation. Remember, the treatment um, group equal, uh, it only reveals the outcome under the treatment condition y of 1. So you can replace yi with y of 1, and then you can take that out from the um, expectation sign because we are conditioning on the, the, the set of potential outcomes. Okay? And then we know that the treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcome. So expectation of TI given cardio or N is simply expectation of TI, which is equal to N1 over N. That's the proportion under complete randomization. That's the proportion of the units who are assigned to the treatment. So, um, so it's simply substituting ny over n into that equation, ny cancels, and then it gives uh, you 1 over n of sum of y, y of 1. The same thing you can do to the control loop, and then we um, obtain the fact that the difference in means estimator is unbiased for some part of the effect. So it's a very simple... Um, manipulation, but what's very important here is that the only thing that's random here is the treatment assignment. Everything else is fixed. And then we can show that difference in means estimator is indeed unbiased, on average equal to uh, true value of some average treatment effect. Now we can extend this analysis to derive the variance of difference in means estimator. Okay. Again, we're going to use the idea that the randomness comes only from the treatment assignment. Now, I'm going to leave the derivation uh, to you for an exercise, but here um, I'll just give an expression. So the variance of tau hat, that's the difference in means estimator, conditional on potential outcomes, because right, we are interested in sample average streaming effect, is given by that form. Okay. So it's it's a function of three things. The first two terms is related to the sample variance of potential outcome. Okay, so 1 over n minus 1, the sum of y of, yi of t minus mean of, sample mean of y of t. 
Okay, so y of t bar is a sample mean of y of t potential outcome. So this is the sample variance of each of the potential outcomes. So s1 squared, s0 squared is the sample variance of y of 1 and y of 0 respectively. This, these two terms we can estimate it from the data, right? Because although we do not observe this, because we only observe one of two potential outcomes, we can look at the treatment group, which is randomly selected. So the variance of the treatment group is going to be a good estimate for S1 squared. Variance of the control group is going to be a good estimate for S0 squared. Now what's tricky is the third term. 2 times S01. The S01 here is the sample covariance of Y0 and Y1, and the expression is written there. Okay, so this is a sample covariance of two potential outcomes. Now we realize that this term can never be estimated because I remember that we never observe two potential outcomes at the same time. So it's impossible. We have actually no information whatsoever about, uh, we cannot calculate uh, the correlation between y of 0 and y of 1. Okay? So what this means that because S01 term cannot be uh, identified, the, the whole variance is actually not identifiable. So you may ask, so what should we do? Well, one thing we can do is to put some bounds on S01, the covariance term. We can do that by um, using the cosy schwartz inequality, for example. So cosy schwartz inequality allows you to bound the covariance using the marginal variances or standard deviation in this case. Okay? So the upper bound corresponds to the case where the correlation between two potential outcomes are equal to exactly one. And then the lower bound corresponds to the case where the correlation between Two potential outcomes is exactly negative one. Okay, so all we know is that S01, the covariance, sample covariance, which we cannot directly estimate, can be bounded between these two quantities. Basically, the standard deviation, the product of two standard deviations, standard deviation of each potential outcome. By plugging in these upper bound and lower bound, we can obtain the upper bound and lower bound of the variance. So although we cannot estimate the variance itself, we can estimate the upper bound. So usually we, we are interested in conservative variance. Um, in statistics, we want to be conservative. So we can estimate the upper bound of the variance and then compute the standard error. Okay. Uh, in the literature, there is a sharper bounds. That is, there, there are uh, better bounds um, if you actually use the entire marginal distribution of the potential outcomes. Here we are only using the moments um, to bound the variance, but you can, there's a lot, a bit, little bit more information. Uh, so you can narrow the bounds uh, if you use the information based on uh, entire marginal distribution, not just the moments. Okay. So this is the uh, something we can always do in causal inference. If, some, uh, if the quantity is not identifiable, we can think about are there bounds. We can put the bounds and then uh, estimate the bounds uh, instead. Okay, so what about the usual variance estimator? Uh, it turns out that we can show that the usual variance estimator is conservative on average. Um, here, uh, it can be shown that the variance of tau hat is uh, less than or equal to S1 squared over N1 plus S0 squared over N0, where the S1 squared is a sample variance of Y1, and then S0 squared is a sample variance of Y of 0, right, two potential outcomes. Now, obviously, we cannot calculate the S1 squared, S0 squared, but um, we can estimate it. And that usual estimator is simply taking the treatment group and then computing the sample variance of the outcome of the treated units. And that estimator, here we're going to denote this as sigma squared 1 uh, hat. And that's unbiased estimator for S1 squared. Okay. The similarly, uh, the same thing happens uh, for the control group. Now again, this expectation 
is over the treatment assignment uh, conditional on cardio N, which is the potential outcome. So again, on, um, we can estimate the variance, the conservative variance, um, which without bias over repeated uh, randomized experiment, over repeated randomized treatment assignment, hypothetical experiment. Now, uh, under the constant additive unit causal effect assumption, that is, suppose everybody has the same um, additive treatment effect. So y of 1 minus y of 0 is equal to c for some constant c. So if everybody had the same constant effect, then we know that the variance of the treatment effect, individual level treatment effect, is equal to 0 because it's constant. Everybody has the same. Uh, effect, so the variance is zero. And from this fact, if you think about the left-hand side, it can be written as variance of y of 1 uh, plus variance of y of 0 minus 2 times covariance of y of 1 and y of 0. Then the covariance uh, can be written as one half of the sum of two variances. Okay, so previously we wrote that uh, the variance of the difference means estimator involves this covariance term, which we don't know. Uh, here, if we assume the treatment effect is constant additive um, and the same for everybody, then we know exactly what the variance, uh, the covariance S01 is. Um, and then we can just simply plug that in to the variance expression. And it turns out that in that case, the variance equals to this usual variance uh, estimator. So. What this tells you is that usual variance estimator we all use um, is on average conservative. That's a good thing. Um, and it's going to be exactly the same as the actual variance um, uh, on average um, if the, uh, the treatment effect is the same for everybody. We can use this um, to compute this type of variance expression to compute the optimal treatment assignment rule. So all we have to do is, what is the um, proportion of the treatment uh, group that will minimize the variance of the difference in means estimator? Okay, so you can um, take a derivative with respect to n1 and then set it to zero. And then you can show that the optimal, if you solve that, optimal proportion of the trimming group is given by this expression, n over 1 plus s0, um, the ratio of s0 and s1. And this is quite intuitive because s0 and s1 is a standard deviation of two potential outcomes. Okay. So suppose that the standard deviation of y1, uh, the outcome under the treatment, is much larger than the outcome under the control group. Right? So maybe um, the treatment uh, benefits some people but hurts others. So y of 1 um, is more valuable than y of 0. Okay? In that case, um, the ratio s0 over s1 is going to be small. Okay? So that will make the denominator small which will make the, um, the treatment group, uh, optimal treatment group size much larger. So this makes sense. So in order to account for the fact that y of 1 is much more uh, variable than y of 0, we have to have a larger treatment group relative to the control group. Conversely, if the potential outcome under the control group is much, um, much more variable relative to the treatment group, then we have to allocate more units to the control group in order to minimize the, um, the resulting variance of the difference in means estimator. Okay. So this uh, variance expression is useful um, to figure out what would be the optimal uh, treatment assignment rule is.